long before Japan was an island, before rice patties stitched the land into neat green mosaics, before emperors reigned and samurai walked, a different kind of people arrived. They came not as conquerors, but as shadows drifting on the edges of a forgotten coastline. Thousands of years ago, when Southeast Asia was still a continuous stretch of land now swallowed by the sea, a wave of early humans moved silently northward. Their destination, an unclaimed volcanic archipelago that would one day be called Japan. But they didn't come from where you think. Genetic footprints hidden in ancient bones tell us they weren't Chinese. They weren't Korean. They weren't even like other early East Asians. Instead, their closest living echoes lie thousands of miles away, in the tropical forests of Laos, the shores of the Andaman Islands, and the Himalayan fringes of Nepal. This was a migration not from the north, but the south, a route-hugging jungled coasts and island chains, taken by a people who saw the world not as land to conquer, but as a rhythm to follow. Fish, forest, fire. These early wanderers, the ancestors of what we now call the Jaman, broke off from the rest of East Asia before there was a rest to speak of. Genome sequencing places their divergence somewhere between 25,000 and 38,000 years ago, before the genetic branch that would become Han Chinese, Korean, or even the Neolithic rice farming populations of the mainland. In genetic trees, they don't appear as a branch, they appear as a trunk, a basal root, a starting point, and then nature sealed them in. As the last glacial maximum ended, rising seas turned the Japanese archipelago into an isolated cradle. For the Jaman, this isolation wasn't a limitation, it was preservation. Across millennia, as metal tools spread across Asia and agriculture redefined civilization, the Jaman kept living the way their ancestors had, foraging, hunting, adapting to mountain, river, and sea. Their language faded. Their tools became buried. But their genes remained. Modern science, armed with DNA from ancient teeth and femurs, now whispers their truth. And that truth begins here. They weren't just the first people in Japan. They were the first to become something new. A lineage untouched by later waves. A people who carved their identity in silence, and whose echo still pulses in the veins of millions. Though most will never know it. As mainland Asia surged with waves of migration, Neolithic farmers, Bronze Age warriors, dynasties rising and falling, there was one place the tides of time could not reach, an island locked behind walls of salt water and time. There, the Jaman people didn't just survive. They crystallized. While civilizations across the continent evolved through exchange and conquest, the Jaman became a world unto themselves, genetically, culturally, and biologically unlike anyone else. In the silence of their mountains and coastal forests, a hidden evolution was unfolding. The Jaman were being shaped by war or empire. They were being shaped by isolation. With no contact for thousands of years, their DNA became a sealed archive of an ancient human story, one no one else could tell. And when that archive was finally opened, the world changed. The first sign was found in the Y chromosome. The unbroken paternal thread passed from father to son. In Jaman remains, scientists discovered something striking. A lineage called D1A2, also known as D1B. This isn't just a rare genetic variant. It's a signature of deep time, virtually non-existent in China or Korea. This haplogroup survives today almost exclusively in the Ainu of Hokkaido and parts of Japan, the last genetic embers of the Jaman. Its origins trace back tens of thousands of years to populations that took a very different path from the rest of East Asia. But it didn't stop there. The maternal line, mitochondrial DNA passed from mother to child, revealed an equally stunning divergence. The haplogroups M7A and N9B, found again and again in Jaman skeletons, are nearly absent in modern East Asians. They are ghosts in the genome. And yet, in Ainu villages and Okinawan fishing communities, these markers still flicker. They are the fingerprints of ancestors who never touched rice, who never built cities, but who knew how to live with the sea. Why is this so important? Because when modern Japanese DNA was sequenced at scale, over 3,000 whole genomes, the truth emerged. The Jaman had contributed up to 28% of the Okinawan genetic pool, nearly 80% of Ainu ancestry, and up to 20% even in urban Japan. But the source of that ancestry wasn't continental Asia. 
It was a genetic world that had developed in near-total isolation. A world where genetic drift, the slow reshuffling of traits over generations, operated without outside influence. This gave rise to long, uninterrupted haplotypes, rare alleles, and even entirely unclassified SNPs. In fact, ancient Jamin genomes contain thousands of mutations that don't appear in public genetic databases like DBSNP because they existed nowhere else. This isn't just a statistical anomaly. It's a biological monument. Population geneticists describe the Jamin genome as exhibiting unusually high linkage disequilibrium, a sign that these people lived in small, isolated groups for millennia. Fewer than 1,000 effective individuals, generation after generation, sheltered by forest, mountain, and the edge of the sea. Their DNA didn't blend, it deepened. When scientists performed principal component analysis, the genetic equivalent of drawing a family tree, the Jamin didn't fall among Koreans, or Chinese, or Siberians. They stood entirely apart. In the cloud of East Asian ancestry, they appeared as a lone signal on the margins, whispering of a story the world had forgotten. And what makes this even more extraordinary is that this wasn't the end of their story, because despite this vast separation, their genes still pulse faintly through the blood of millions alive today. People who walk the neon-lit streets of Tokyo, unaware they carry in their DNA a time capsule, one sculpted by complete genetic solitude. They didn't leave behind pyramids or palaces, but what they did leave behind was something far more intimate, the blueprint of their bodies. Within their ancient DNA, encoded not by ink or inscription but by nature itself, lies the story of how they lived what they needed to survive, and the forces that shaped them. The Jamin were not farmers. They were hunters, foragers, deep forest wanderers, and tidal fishers. And every generation refined what the last had left behind, not in tools alone, but in the very chemistry of their blood, the shape of their limbs, and the rhythms of their metabolism. Their genes whisper of a body built for endurance, not speed, not muscle, but patience. Genetic markers linked to short stature were common, not as a flaw, but as an advantage in navigating the dense, mountainous forests of ancient Japan. A compact frame uses less energy, conserves heat, and moves quietly through underbrush. Evolution wasn't random here. It was precise. But the most astonishing adaptations were invisible. Modern genomic scans reveal that the Jamin had variants linked to elevated triglycerides and glucose retention. In today's world, those traits might be associated with metabolic disorders, but in the world of the Jamin, they were survival tools, biochemical safeguards for a life without certainty. When winter stretched long and food was scarce, these genes allowed their bodies to hold on to every ounce of energy. They were the biological echoes of hunger, shaped not by want, but by necessity. There's more. Many Jamin individuals carried a version of the ALDH2 gene that allowed more efficient alcohol processing. This allele is rare in East Asia today, but in Jamin DNA, it was present long before sake was ever brewed. Why? Possibly as a byproduct of fermenting foods or consuming natural alcohols found in wild fruits. Whatever the cause, it was yet another trait that set them apart, a biochemical fingerprint no dynasty ever claimed. And then there are the details no skeleton can show, but DNA can. Hair type, skin tone, earwax. The Jamin likely had dark skin, suited to long hours in the sun and a life near the coast. Their hair was probably curly, not straight like that of later Yayo migrants. And the peculiar marker for wet earwax? Present. It may seem trivial, but it's a genetic trait tied to apocrine gland activity, part of thermoregulation and scent communication. It tells us they were biologically closer to southern populations yet geographically alone. Each of these traits is a clue, not just about appearance, but about interaction, about how a people moved, hunted, gathered, and endured. They tell us the Jamin weren't primitive. They were precisely calibrated to a life in harmony with unpredictable nature. Their DNA was their map, and it didn't just chart ancestry. It documented survival. When scientists sequenced Jamin genomes and compared them to modern Japanese, they didn't just find distance. They found fragments of these traits still lingering. I knew children with shorter limbs. Okinawan families with higher natural fat retention. 
Isolated echoes of a vanished lifestyle, now struggling to survive in a world of processed food and concrete. And this is what makes the Jamin genome so haunting. It doesn't just reveal who they were. It reminds us how fragile and how persistent human adaptation can be. Traits once meant to protect us can, in a different age, betray us. Genes born from necessity can become burdens in comfort. Yet they remain quiet, unchanged, waiting because the body never forgets what it once needed to survive. You don't need to dig through ancient soil to find the jamin. You only need to look beneath the skin, in a Tokyo subway or an Okinawa market, in the curve of a cheekbone or the pattern of a fingerprint. Fragments of a people long vanished still linger, silent, scattered, alive. These aren't myths. They're measurable, real, etched into the very cells of modern Japan. And yet, the legacy they left behind isn't spread evenly. In the far north, among the Ainu of Hokkaido, the Jamin voice is almost untouched. Genetic analyses show they carry upwards of 79% of their ancestral components from the Jamin, an unbroken line, stretching across thousands of winters. The same markers, the same ancient haplogroups, the same immune system quirks. Time changed the world, but here, the thread held firm. Go south to the Ryukyu Islands, and the signal remained strong, though more blended. Okinawans show close to 28% Jamin ancestry, far more than their mainland neighbors. It's in their stature, in their mitochondrial lineages, in the way certain genetic traits continue to resist the currents of modernity, but move inland toward Honshu's crowded plains and Kyushu's historic ports, and the story becomes more complex. Here, centuries of migration, Farmers from the continent, imperial expansions, internal movement, have diluted the Jamin signature. Still, it hasn't disappeared. Around 13 to 20 percent of modern mainland Japanese DNA can be traced back to this ancient people. Not evenly, not uniformly, but always there. This genetic mosaic reveals a truth history books often forget. Modern populations are not pure rivers, but confluences. The Japanese genome is not a single story, but a layered chronicle. Jamin ancestry sits deep in that sediment, not visible at the surface, perhaps, but absolutely foundational. And just as genes remember, so does the body. A recent whole genome project by Japanese scientists revealed a stunning fact. Many traits once thought to be modern, like resistance to certain metabolic diseases or the way the body stores energy, are in fact inherited from Jamin ancestors. In Okinawa, centenarians carry alleles linked not to agricultural efficiency, but to foraging resilience. These aren't flukes. They're evolutionary legacies. Even now, in state-of-the-art hospitals and genetic labs, researchers are uncovering medical mysteries whose answers lie not in textbooks, but in ancient bones unearthed from Jamin burial sites. And then there's the mystery of cultural echo. Why do I knew oral traditions mention hunting gods? fire spirits, and rituals so different from Shinto? Why do Ryukyuan folk practices mirror beliefs not found on the mainland? The answer may not just be cultural. It may be ancestral. Culture, like language, can be shaped by biology. And when biology spans tens of thousands of years, echoes can last longer than memory. The Jamin are gone. Their language, their rituals, their daily lives, all dust. But the genome remembers. Inside the bloodstream of millions, tiny molecular signatures still pulse to the rhythm of a forgotten era. Each cell a monument, each allele a whisper, each person, unknowingly, carrying a spark from a people who once walked barefoot through cedar forests, who watched the same moon rise over the same Pacific horizon, but in a world before names. They didn't leave behind cities. They left behind something more permanent, themselves and us. When scientists first mapped the ancient genome of the Jamin, they expected to find familiar patterns, threads that would tie them neatly into the fabric of East Asia. But what they uncovered didn't fit. The DNA didn't match the Han. It didn't echo the Korean Peninsula. It didn't share the Siberian ancestry of northern foragers. It didn't even touch the wave of Neolithic farmers that once swept the continent. It stood alone, like a voice speaking a language no one remembered. In the vast genetic networks of Eurasia, most ancient populations connect. There are pathways, links between Ice Age Siberians and Native Americans, 
between Neolithic farmers and today's coastal Chinese, between Indo-Europeans and Central Asians. But the Jamin? They're an anomaly. Their DNA forms a branch that seems suspended, isolated from both the northern and southern clusters of East Asia. No admixture from the Malta boy of Siberia. No connection to the Austronesian expansions that colonized the Pacific. They don't sit near the Tibetans. They don't align with the Altaic groups. Even the Paleolithic Chinese genome known as Tianyuan Man, who lived 40,000 years ago, appears genetically closer to other East Asians than the Jamin do. So where do they belong? Surprisingly, the closest echoes come not from the north, but the south. Their genome shows shared ancestry with an 8,000-year-old Hoabinian hunter-gatherer from ancient Laos. They cluster near the Andamanese, isolated islanders of the Indian Ocean, and in phylogenetic trees. The Jamin fall beside groups like the Kasunda of Nepal, whose language and genetics are equally mysterious. It's a map that tells a very different story. A story not of empires and conquest, but of early human wanderers, drifting along coastal shores before agriculture, before borders. It suggests that the ancestors of the Jamin may have risen from a southern migration, long before the great civilizations of East Asia began to take shape, a migration forgotten by most histories, preserved only in the cold of ancient DNA. But here's the twist. Their genes remain untouched by the very lineages that transformed Asia. No blending with the ancient northern Eurasians who gave rise to the Yamnaya or ancient North Eurasians. No contribution from the massive genetic waves that birthed the Han, the Turkic tribes, or the Mongolic expansions. Even the great eastward movements that filled the Americas left no trace on them. Their DNA wasn't just different. It was excluded. A time capsule with its own timeline, its own direction, a separate evolutionary path that walked away from everyone else before the roads had names. And this is why the Jamin genome is more than rare. It's revolutionary. Because in a world obsessed with connections, they remind us of the power of disconnection, of what happens when a people live untouched, unshaped by empires or migrations, only by land, sea, and silence. Their uniqueness isn't defined by what they had. It's defined by what they never took in. No one else in East Asia carries their signature fully anymore, except, perhaps, the Ainu. But even there, centuries of contact have diluted the line. The Jamin, as they existed, are genetically extinct. And yet, ironically, their outlier status makes them more visible than ever. In genomic studies, they appear like a flare, a bold signal that cuts through the noise. In maps, they occupy space no one else can reach. In history, they mark a gap we never knew existed. Because sometimes, to understand what we are, we have to understand what we never became.